first of all. There we go. Um, you may or may not, I'm not sure, because this is a webinar versus a meeting, you may see a screen that says this is being recorded, please consent. If so, please click check yes to that. If it's not showing up, that's fine. This is only the second time ever that we've had that particular setting. So I don't even know if it happens in a webinar. Um, but thank you very much for joining us tonight. My name is Mirka Zaplatel and I am the Director of Education at the McAuliffe Shepherd Discovery Center. And tonight, I am so excited, we are going to be learning about mammoths from Susie Spickle of the Harris Center. So this is part of our monthly Superstellar Friday event, which we've started doing remotely um, and it's, I think, worked reasonably well, even though it is so nice to be able to see everyone in person. Um, but I'll also admit that, you know, I, I ate dinner and came right downstairs and here I am ready to go. So tonight we have a guest speaker from the Harris Center in Hancock, New Hampshire. She's one of the um, naturalist educators there. She also works with the community outreach programs, originally from Brooklyn. New York, so a bit of a different environment, um, but obviously really passionate about the, the space where we are today. And um, when I asked Susie about doing a presentation for us, she kind of threw out a couple of possible animal topics, but the second she said mammoths, I was like, that's it, we've got a winner. So I am so excited to have her talking to us about New England's long ago elephants. So I'm going to mute myself now and uh, just kind of pop up every now and then when there's a question. Thank you, Susie. Thank you so much, Mirka. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me from um, the Harris Center. Come talk at the McAuliffe Shepherd Discovery Center. I love that place. Um, and I love the opportunity to talk about my longest, furriest love, the woolly mammoth tonight. Um, and it's really an exciting chance for me to share my passion about this forgotten elephant that once wandered in our landscape right here. And I want to thank all of you. I can't see you, but I hope you're all out there um, for coming out tonight to hear about this forgotten creature. And I know this isn't going to be a talk about stars or space or anything cosmic like a UFO, but I, it, I think it's really fascinating. And I hope by the end of my talk, you love this woolly beast as much as I do. Oh. I'm having trouble advancing my screen, so let me try that. Before I get started, I have to talk a little bit about um, the Harris Center. Gosh, you guys can't see it. Did it, it didn't advance on your end, did it? Hmm, let me try this. Sorry, I'm having some technical problems here. I hate when that happens. Nope. Okay, Marka, I don't know what's going on. No, I can see your, I can see your air, your cursor moving around. So I see yeah. that much. Maybe try clicking on the PowerPoint again to get to remind it that you're in that program. Yeah, it's weird. Um, nope, it's really odd. Okay, hold on. We might have we might have to go back and um, restart my screen sharing. What happens now? Nope. Okay, Mirka. Sorry. Yes. Con ground control to Major yes. Tom over here. How Let me. Um, Let's go back, let me stop sharing my screen and I gotta go back to my old fashioned way of showing my slide, okay. I think. Okay, uh, let's try this. What do you see now? Uh, give it a sec, I see the, just the full, I mean, just the slide. It's not showing me anything else. It says New England's long ago elephants. Okay, let me try and advancing it again. Nope, okay. Sorry, people out there, uh, this is going to work. Let me try one more time. <laughs> Technology is amazing and it works until it doesn't. What do you see now? Okay, hold on, give me a, so once again, it is just- Oh, get out. Okay, hold on. What's going on, people? Let me try this. I never have this trouble. <laughs> and you, you wouldn't know that we actually practiced this before we even started the meeting to make sure- What do you see now? It is just the single- side. Oh, get out. Okay, I'm gonna unplug my double screen. Hold on, let's try this. Okay. Oh, God. <laughs> okay. It's okay. Your screen is paused. What it's do you see great. now? It's great. Still that single slide. Oh my goodness. What's going on? What do you see now? Oh, it advanced. Yay. Okay. I let me go back. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. Hi. <laughs> so now you see some girls and uh, some students pointing at a tree? Absolutely. 
Perfect. Okay, I lost this picture of my Harris Center, um, but I wanted to spend a little bit of time just telling everybody about the Harris Center. You might not be familiar with it. We're located in Hancock, New Hampshire, and we're a land trust, but we do a lot more than land trusty stuff. We do a lot of public education. We work in three different school districts with 5,000 different students from kindergarten through 12th grade which is exciting. We run lots of community programs for people of all ages, all the way from our Babies and Backpacks program and Toddlers in Tow, which this is a picture of, to programs in assisted living and even hospice situations. And we do protect land. We have over 24,000 acres of land protected in the Monadnock region. And what you're seeing here is just a lot of no houses. And that's what the Harris Center has been working on for the past 50 years is um, limiting development so that land can be contiguous and animals can have room to roam, but also people. All of our land is open to people. We have lots of trails and our hope is that people can connect to the land and find a way to kind of get recharged and give back to the land, reciprocity. Um, and we have been very busy in the last few years developing a new program. And that program is a citizen science or community science program where we're working with local scientists um, and programs like this, the Raptor Observatory at Pac-Monadnock with Audubon. We co-sponsor this hawk watching site that's been running for over 15 years now, keeping data on the hawks flying by. We have our salamander brigades that help volunteers help cross thousands of salamanders every spring. And even this year, we're developing a cyanobacteria pro program for communities to use to monitor their own lakes in their own yards, backyards or communities. And I, I really like this. This is really, for me, what makes the Harris Center so special. Um, it's the idea that we um, are making a better world for our kids to live in. And um, how about me? I love to talk about animals um, and I talk about all types of animals. So when Mirka said I gave her a bunch of choices, I did. Um, I like to talk about animals with bad reputations, like the fisher. I like to talk about animals that aren't often seen, um, but are really unique, like the star-nosed mole. I love to talk about surprising animals, like the short-tailed shrew that is actually the only venomous mammal in all of North America. Its venom is closely associated to cobra venom. That is so cool. I love to talk about this stuff and, and that's part of my work at the Harris Center. I like to share my passion about animals in hopes that it helps people connect to our natural world. So you might be wondering, how come I'm talking about woolly mammoths? How did someone fall in love with an animal that doesn't walk this land anymore? You can't go out and watch it. You can't help it cross a busy road. You can't um, follow its tracks in the snow usually. Um, how, how come woolly mammoths? Well, for me, I first fell in, woolly, in love with woolly mammoths a long time ago when I was a kid. I spent my summers in outside of Brattleboro, Vermont. And if you've ever been to the Brooks Library in Brattleboro, Vermont in the kids section, I don't know if it's still there, but they had a tusk, an actual woolly mammoth tusk. And I would spend a lot of time at that tusk. It was discovered in 1865 in a wet meadow that I walked in as a kid. And every time I walked in it, I would think this is where the woolly mammoth once was. It was actually here. Someone found it and I would look for it. And I have a confession to make. Um, I hope nobody's a librarian, but when nobody was looking, I actually touched that tusk as a child. And I can remember how it felt in my hands, cold and kind of smooth and really hard. And I think it was that moment when I touched it that a little bit of the woolly mammoth's spirit or fire got in me and I became really obsessed. In fact, I still am. Whenever I'm out in my garden in Hancock digging or planting or putting a tree in, every time I put my shovel in the soil, I think, this is the time I'm going to find a, a woolly mammoth bone and I haven't yet found one. But if you ever need someone to help you dig, give me a call. I'll come over. I'll look for the woolly mammoth stuff. If I find one, I'll share it with you and we can touch it and look at it. But then we're going to give it to science, which would be really cool. Um, when I wasn't in Brattleboro, 
staring and secretly touching the woolly mammoth tusk, I would spend my time um, from Brooklyn. I'd take the train over to the American Museum of Natural History and spend a lot of time in this hallway. Um, this is the Mastodon and Mammoth hallway, and I would sit by it and actually even went to college. I didn't choose to go to college next to the museum. I just happened to end up at Barnard College in New York City, and I was so lucky because my apartment was right near the museum. I did all of my studying. I wrote many papers. Um, I studied for exams. I, I did everything right next to this woolly mammoth. And I know that um, it must must it must miss me as much as I miss it. So you could say that um, I got into it at an early age. If somebody had said to me that I could have a pet woolly mammoth, I would have jumped at the chance. And tonight, I hope you leave this talk with the same fire in your belly for woolly mammoths that I have. So let's talk about woolly mammoths. There were actually two types of ancient elephants or elephant types that lived in New England um, during the last ice age, the mammoths, the woolly mammoth and the mastodon. My talk today is really gonna focus on the woolly mammoth and not so much on the mastodon, but Mirka, Next year, if you want to invite me back, I'll come prepared to do a whole talk on the Mastodon. I'm sure I can fall in love with it too. But, but today's talk is really on the woolly mammoth. I do want to just mention that they did live in different habitats. And this slide kind of shows you. Um, woolly mammoths lived on the steppe or the tundra. And it was called periglacial tundra. That's the spot where the glacier is beginning to kind of move, it recedes, it comes back, it recedes and comes back, and it leaves this very roughed up um, area. And the woolly mammoth, that was its habitat, its home. It lived on the tundra grasses. The mastodon lived more in the bogs and the wetlands, and they were smaller than the woolly mammoths, and they ate things that were a little different than the woolly mammoths. They were more um, eaters of the inner bark of things. And recent scientists have suggested that the mastodon was actually pretty semi aquatic, that it spent a lot of time in the water, which I just would, wow, imagine if you went to like Panema Bog and instead of seeing a sweet bird, you saw a mastodon in the water. That would just be incredible. So the mastodon and the woolly mammoth are part of an ancient family of the elephants or proboscidem, and they are animals that are related to uh, well, not the mastodon, but the woolly mammoth is related to the two elephants that we still have living on earth, the African elephant and the Asian elephant. The mastodon was sort of its own separate thing. And you can see this in this evolutionary kind of picture um, where it shows you that they all, all the elephants came from an ancient um, relative or ancient descendant. I don't even, not even gonna try to say the name of that elephant descent or ancestor. But you can see that they all went off and we had a woolly mammoth and the American mastodon in its own branch. The woolly mammoth is closely related to the Asian elephant and then there's the African savanna elephant. Um, and those are the only two elephants that we have left on our planet now because the woolly mammoth is extinct and so is the mastodon. Um, and what is so fascinating about the woolly mammoth for me is that it lived um, it lived on Earth for a really long time, 300,000 years ago to just about 3,700 years ago, there was a last holdout population of woolly mammoths. And I'll talk about that in a moment, but these are um, the two skeletons. The mastodon um, is smaller. This is the mastodon elephant right here or the mastodon. And then here's the woolly mammoth. You can see difference in size. The mastodon was smaller. The woolly mammoth was about 10 feet at shoulder height and it weighed about eight tons, more or less. That's what they suggest. And they lived all over the United States. So, I mean, that's just amazing to me. If you look, the yellow is where mammoths once lived. We had woolly mammoths all the way from um, Canada down to Kansas. And then there were actually two other types of mammoths. There was the Jefferson mammoth and the Columbia mammoth. And those lived kind of further down. And the Columbia mammoth lived more out on the West Coast, which is really interesting to me. And one of these days, I'm going to get a chance to head out to the West Coast and visit um, a spot where you can see some woolly mammoth, or not woolly mammoth, Colum Col 
Columbia mammoth remains. Um, right now, a lot of mammoths are being revealed, their bodies are being revealed in Siberia as climate change is affecting the permafrost and it's melting away, um, bodies and bones of woolly mammoths are being exposed in Russia and Siberia, places like that. And I just recently read that there's actually a really huge illegal trade going on in China of mammoth ivory. 50% of all ivory being traded into China comes from um, woolly mammoth tusks that are being harvested from these permafrost frost finds, which I just think is kind of wild and sad. A tusk can be sold for $250,000. And that's actually quite a bit of money for um, the people, the indigenous people that live in these places. It can support their village for like a whole year. So you can see kind of what's driving the trade, the money is driving that trade. Woolly mammoths um, had some really unique adaptations and that's really what I'm gonna focus on is the adaptations of the woolly mammoth. Let me just go back for a minute and talk about the tusks. So lots of people wonder what they use their tusks for and they use their tusks just for the same things that um, elephants use their tusks for now. The males use them to determine mating privilege. Um, so they battled, they kind of fought with their tusks and um, they also use them to show kind of just dominance. If you big tusk, more dominant, you're leader of the pack. There is some evidence that the woolly mammoths use their tusks a little bit like a plow to plow away and dig up or push away the snow that would have covered their territory um, to be able to get to the grasses that they would eat, which um, is kind of a neat image to think of tusk as a plow. Um, they were eating a lot of grasses, they're herbivores. So if you're an eight ton animal and you are subsisting on just plant material, you've gotta be eating a lot and very often. And you have to have really specialized teeth to do this. They ate lots of roughage and their teeth were really designed for grinding up this rough material. You can kind of see right here, these ridges and these, the teeth were made up of dentine and enamel and the, the upper and lower jaw would work together. So the ridges would grind up the food and they would get kind of caught up or masticate the food in those ridges so that they could get, break it open and get the most nutritional value out of the food that they were eating. When scientists look at these teeth and they count the ridges, some of the teeth would have up to 30 ridges. So each tooth would have up to 30 ridges to work as grinding up their food. And really they, um, the theory is just like our uh, African and Asian elephants now is that they really just had to be constantly kind of feeding and eating. Lots of people think they must use their trunk for eating, but they don't. Their trunk is used for breathing, you wouldn't eat through your nose and a trunk is just an elongated nose. So they're eating kind of um, through their mouth and they're using their trunk to get water and to smell and to communicate. And nobody knows if mast uh, mastodons or woolly mammoths kind of um, trumpeted the way that elephants do nowadays, but I would imagine that they probably did. Marco, but I know I'm going like a train out of the station. Let me just stop and ask if there are any questions before I go on. So uh, for anyone who has questions, please put them into the chat or the Q&A and I will pass them along. I, I do have a question looking at this picture myself right now. So is that just two teeth? That's all that, that yes. the lower jaw had was two teeth? Yes, they didn't have a lot of teeth. They just okay. had two really big really teeth. big teeth <laughs> i know it's, yeah. that's a gigantic tooth i mean you can see that person's hand so yes you know how big yeah that's a great question um yeah they didn't really have a lot of teeth and in fact in a way one tooth was like 30 teeth because right. each tooth had a, like up to 30 ridges or that's what they've counted that's the maximum they've gotten to so each ridge acted like its own grinders just like we have our tooth it acts like it's a singular grinder so yeah, I guess you're in trouble though if you break one of your teeth. <laughs> Great, well, I, I was thinking like that those are really big. I mean, those are just gigantic teeth. Uh, so it's fascinating to me, like one really big on one side versus many smaller. So. Exactly, exactly. Great question. Okay, and, yeah. So 
it also looks to me, oh wait, for a second there was a hand up, but now it's gone down again. So uh, okay. there is something in the Q&A, so hold on. Sure. So the question is from George, it says, is this the upper teeth or the lower teeth? Um, and did they have teeth on both, on both top and bottom? Yeah, they had teeth on top and bottom. They worked together that they needed teeth up on the top and the bottom to grind up. And I don't know if this is a lower jaw, jaw or upper jaw. I'm not 100% sure. So I don't want to answer and be incorrect. So I'm going to leave it as unknown. Another mystery of the woolly mammoth to be solved. Um, and I'll definitely look into that. And I'll have to go back and check my citation and look and see. But that's a good question. Okay, and then we have another one from David that says, I've heard of mammoth and mastodon teeth being found in the ocean and rivers, but have there been any skeletons found in New Hampshire? We aren't known for our fossil preservation. I know, right? I wish we were. I think I'm living in the wrong state, but the places in New England where um, mammoth finds or mammoth things are found is indeed the ocean. You hear about fishermen, especially lobster, men pulling up um, a bone or a tooth. And that's because, you know, you have to imagine we, we are living where they live, but the landscape was vastly different. And um, yeah, on New Hampshire, there have been some finds in New Hampshire. There was a mammoth found, oh, I can't remember the town. Um, there was one mammoth found, one mammoth, bones found in its northern New Hampshire, but I can't remember where. I should have checked that out. So I'm really sorry to not remember. Um, and then again, in Vermont, there was the find in Brattleboro. And I think there was a find, another find maybe in Dorset, Vermont, or nearby there. Um, but again, the best place to be looking for mammoth finds in New Hampshire is the coastline and head out with the fishermen. And that would be so exciting. Uh, I'll have to put that on my to-do list when we can do things again, go out with a lobster fisherman. Yeah, that would be exciting. Yeah. So we have a request as well from uh, Chris, which says, can, I, can we see one of the pictures with the curved tusks almost touching again? There was one with the skeletons, I believe. I've always wondered why they curved in like that. And now I'm thinking about them using them like a snowplow. It's amazing. Yeah, I can go back. It's a great question. Let me just go back. So um, Chris, is this the picture you're thinking of where they kind of curled back in? Yeah, I mean, it, it does make sense that their tusk would kind of need to be able to push and pull away the snow. Um, and the curving in would be really good. And they find the tusks in lots of different kind of shapes, but often there's a bend or a curve to them. And you can see the mastodons had a little bit of a different shape. Their, their tusks weren't as big and they didn't kind of curl in as much. And again, if you think back to the difference between what scientists think they ate, um, you could see they don't need to push away the snow so much. They're feeding more on on the inner bark of things. Um, and maybe their tusks would have gotten in the way if they curved in as much. So I hope I answered that question pretty good. Uh, he said, yes, that was the picture okay, that great. he was uh, thinking about. So there are no more questions at the moment, but remember everyone that you can put in something at any time into chat or Q&A and Susie will stop regularly and I will feed those along to her. Right, and again, if I get going, because this is just so exciting for me, um, just pop yourself in, Mirka, and tell me, tell me to take a breath that you have some questions. Because we're about to get into the part of the mammoth that as a naturalist, and that's my work at the Harris Center, um, and particularly mammals, I love adaptations. And I really am, it was really interested in the adaptations that the woolly mammoth would have to have to survive an ice age. Um, and we're going to talk about that. Um, and just before we go in and talk about it, I just want to go over the different sizes of the mammoth. So you can see here the woolly mammoth um, was a big animal, but there were actually even larger mammoths. Um, and they were found more in, in Russia and Siberia. The, that's the, um, the giant ones, or they called, now they call them imperial mammoths or the steppe mammoth. And then we, there was even a really teeny tiny mammoth that was found in the Channel Islands of California um, and also out in Wrangell Island. And I'll be talking about Wrangell Island in a few moments, but this is in, um, in California. 
on an island. And oftentimes when um, animals get trapped on an island, they go through a process where they kind of get smaller. And this um, is a mammoth that is showing that. It's the pygmy mammoth. It was only four to six feet tall. So it would be kind of like the size of a pony. And I always think of the Flintstones. I grew up watching the Flintstones and they always had like dinosaur pets. And if I lived during the Flintstones, if that was real, I would definitely have a one of these pygmy mammoths as my pet. It'd be like the size of a really big Great Dane or, or something like that. Um, and one of these days I'm gonna get out there and see that. And they have um, done a lot of excavation and study of these um, island mammoths, the pygmy mammoths, which is really cool. So the here's um, an artist rendition of what a mammoth looked like. And now um, we're getting more and more clear because we're finding more preserved specimens of mammoths as climate change um, is making the permafrost disappear and these bodies are being discovered. So this rendition is pretty, what they think is pretty accurate based on what they're finding. A lot of times when mammoths are found in the permafrost, their fur will look kind of an orange color, but scientists really believe that that orange coloration that you'll see in, in my slides in a little bit isn't so much what the real color was. It's just from the process of being buried, kind of like um, the icemen that they find um, in the bogs and they're often an orange color. It's just sort of the process of, of being preserved in the permafrost, um, you fade your color. But take a good look at that and you'll notice, take a look at this picture of the mammoth, you'll notice some unique features about it. And I want everybody to just remember this hump, these little ears, um, the trunk, the feet, and the fur, and it, um, we can't see the tail, but we're gonna talk about the tail because we're about to head into um, adaptations. And the adaptations are, are really important because it kind of tells a little bit of the story about how they went extinct. And so I wanna just back up for a minute that the this is like blows my mind away, but the last mammoths on earth did not disappear after the last ice age, which was about 10,000 years ago. There was actually mammoths that persist, persisted up until about 4,000 years ago. And they all lived on an island off of Russia called Wrangell Island. And um, these mammoths were around, this, this blows my mind away, Stonehenge had already been built when these mammoths were still here. And the pyramids in Egypt had been built and there were still mammoths here. So we kind of in our mind think of, oh, the great Egyptian pyramids, there, there were no megafauna left from the Pleistocene. They were all gone, but that's not true. Out on an island, not a little island, but a rather large island about the size of Delaware was a whole herd of um, these Wrangell Island mammoths. And here's a, they're doing a lot, they're finding a lot of them now as again, as I mentioned, the permafrost and able to do a lot of study of them. And there's a lot of wondering, well, how, how come they died out? And just like any kind of island population that doesn't have the ability to have um, inter or breeding with other populations, eventually there were genetic anomalies. And sci some scientists think that that led to kind of the weakening of their of themselves as a species that th they could no longer um, survive. Their capacity to survive healthy had been uh, eliminated. And there's also a lot of theories about the lack of fresh water on the island, um, that as the sea level kept rising, because during the Ice Age, you have to remember the sea level had been very low compared to what it is now. Everything was tied up in glaciers. But as those glaciers melted, just like we might be experiencing, the sea level rose and it impacted the fresh water that was on this island. It infiltrated traded it with salt and these mammoths weren't able to get fresh water. So that's another theory about why they um, no longer persisted on Wrangell Island. But if you wanted to be a mammoth um, scientist, which in my dreams, I would like to be one, um, you would wanna to go to Wrangell Island right now because it's really the hotbed of where a lot of these mammoths are being discovered and looked at. And um, lots of um, information about their genetics is being discovered through the finds that they're, they're finding there. And we'll talk about that implication in terms of, can, could we ever 
um, make a mammoth out of the genes that we're finding, the DNA? Uh, is that in our future to have mammoths again, genetically engineered mammoths to return? We'll talk about that towards the end. Um, and it's good too to think about how did mammoths get to um, America because they really began in Europe and on Asia and then they spread. You can see in this map, they spread across the same way humans did um, that bearing land bridge um, because the water was down and these um, these elephants walked across it along with lots of other amazing megafauna. They weren't the only woolly things. There were woolly rhinoceroses and there were the saber-toothed tigers and dire wolves and all the big kind of exciting ice age animals that um, you might remember seeing in books when you looked at when you were a kid. They all took that land bridge and ended up in the Americas and people followed along. And we'll talk a little bit about people and mammoths and how that intersects but I really wanna drill down into how these animals, elephants, I mean, when we think of elephants, we think of hot places. How did we have a cold weather elephant? It was all about what was on the elephant's body, its design of the elephant. And this is a reconstructed elephant of a baby one that was found in Russia, Lubya. Um, and the elephant, the woolly mammoth had specialized fur that is a little bit like yak fur. And I wanted just to make that comparison. So here's a woolly mammoth and here's yak fur. And you can see here, the yak fur has this kind of skirt. Well, woolly mammoths had actually three types of fur. They had this under fur and then they had guard fur on top of it. And then they had kind of this long coat fur. And the long coat fur was really important. So we're gonna kind of look at the fur backwards. So they had three types of fur. The coat fur would keep them dry when they were kneeling down on the ground resting, just like yak fur does for yaks nowadays. Then if we get a little bit closer, and this is actual picture of a close up bit of mammoth fur. Um, and you can see again, it has that orange color to it, but the real scientists really think they were gray and brown and less orange. Um, and that that's just through the aging process. The um, guard fur were a little bit longer um, than the under fur. So if I'm gonna just use my pointer here you can kind of see these long strands right here. These are the guard fur. And then this kind of wavy fur underneath it is the under fur. What's really amazing too, is that each strand of fur in a mammoth's body came from its own gland. And that gland had an oil, it had oil associated with it. So then that oil helped keep the woolly mammoth's fur dry and coated from really, really intense weather. There was freezing temperatures, there was snow, there was ice, it was arid, it was freezing cold. Underneath where each piece of fur went into each gland, if you went down a little further, right under the gland, there was four inches of fat that insulated the mammoth from this cold weather. Think about that, four inches of fat. So four inches of fat, then this under fur that's really wavy, and then this guard fur that's longer, and then the skirt fur. And when they've done measurements on the skirt fur, they can find pieces of skirt fur that were up to three feet long. That's a really long hair. I have long hair, but my hair is three feet long. I mean, that's, a, that's the size of a little person, like a little, that's a lot of fur. So that's, really essential was the fur of this animal. If they hadn't been woolly and waterproof, they would never have been able to survive the ice age conditions at all. Another fascinating thing about the woolly mammoth is when we think of elephants, here's some, I like this picture, elephant butts. <laughs> we think of these long tails and these are great if you live in a hot place um, they help cool you. They help keep the flies off your bum. Um, they help kind of draw, um, kind of draw your heat out of the in, inside of your body. But if you're a woolly mammoth, you cannot have a big tail. 
you need to have a tiny tail, kind of like Eeyore had. Think about it. it's an Eeyore tail. This is a tiny tail. And they also had tiny ears. And when we think of elephants nowadays, we think of elephants having really big ears. And again, that's for cooling. But these elephants, they lived in freezing conditions. And if they had as big ears and as long a tails as these as our everyday elephants now, um, they would have had frostbite and they were, their bodies would have had to work really hard to keep those extremities warm. So having small ears and a small tail helped make sure that the woolly mammoth wasn't wasting critical energy keeping um, its extremities warm. It might have had small tail and it might have had small ears and lots of fur, but it had really big feet. So this is the foot. This is the actual foot of a woolly mammoth recovered in Russia. I just love this picture. I would love to touch this. Um, its foot was really big. If you measured its foot compared to a um, Asian elephant, which it's closely related to, it is 13 and a half times bigger. And think about how, how amazing that is as an adaptation. Big feet in big snow helps you spread your body weight over a bigger surface area. It's just like wearing snowshoes, so you're not sinking down. If they had their feet were smaller, they would have had a lot more trouble moving through a snowy landscape. So these really big feet were super important to help them navigate this um, rough terrain that they lived in and these harsh conditions. It gave them, kind of, I like to think of this, they were kind of like floating uh, on top of the snow. Not really, because they were still sinking, but it did help them out quite a bit. Perhaps my most favorite adaptation is this. This is the trunk of a woolly mammoth. Um, I just, again, I'm, I'm amazed by it. And what I want you to pay attention to is, um, is this part right here, okay? So if we were looking at a regular elephant's trunk, it wouldn't have this extra flap. Um, what it would have is be a little bit more rounded. And elephants nowadays, they use their trunks for drinking um, and um, breathing and trumpeting. And elephants, uh, the woolly mammoths use them probably for very, very similar things. But again, that's a really long extremity. And to imagine it's not furry, it's not furry like the rest of its body, it would have been really cold, especially at the tip where it would have taken a really long time for the blood to get to. They actually had this extra flap of skin. I like to call it like a a nose mitten and it, it would wrap around the tip and help keep their snout warm. And I just, I love that. It's like I, when you put a mask up around your, your nose. So Mirka, are there any questions about some of these amazing adaptations that the woolly mammoth had? Um, well, there is a question, although uh, I, I don't know if you know the answer to this one, but uh, said if Jenna said, if mammoths benefited from having wide feet, I wonder if prehistoric people in the Ice Age also had bigger feet. Oh, my I God. That you would be able to answer that. But I mean, it does it, it does kind of make sense that that if you're adapted to your environment, you're trying to be as efficient as possible. Oh my gosh. Wow, Jenna, that is such a great question. And I don't know, but I am definitely going to be looking into that. And I appreciate your curiosity because it, it makes my curiosity go crazy. So yeah, I, I'm going to check that out. So did, yeah, did ancient people have larger feet as they traveled to the colder regions? I mean, this is thousands of years of evolution. It's good to remember that. Um, so woolly mammoths, traveled across that land bridge and were around in Asia and Africa 300,000 years ago and they disappeared the majority of them disappeared from our neck of the woods about 10,000 years ago um, so yeah I mean that's a long slow process of evolution and and actually we're going to get to what happened to how the woolly mammoth went extinct and it, it might have to do with not being able to keep up their adaptations with a changing climate, which of course has resonance with us nowadays. So any other questions, Marka? Um, not so much a, a question, but this was a comment for me because this is something I always think about that, that mammoths didn't die out tens of thousands of years ago. But I mean, 
and you made a comment about the pyramids. I mean, it's not just that the pyramids existed. By the time those last mammoths died, the pyramids had already been there for a while. They were oh, yeah. new. So, so just to point out that there was this uh, really long period of overlap. Um, it always makes me wish that I, I had lived like 4,000 years ago so that I could have seen them because in my mind, when I was growing up, I imagined them as so far back in the past, there was no chance. And then I heard about the ones that had survived longer and thought, oh, yeah, we were so close. Yeah, yeah, so true. I mean, um, the pyramids had already been in existence for like a thousand years and Stonehenge had been, they're not sure between, you know, 500 and, and 1300 years um, before the last woolly mammoth you know, no longer existed. And well, I haven't done this yet, but I really want to look at kind of the mythology um, of cultures and see if there's stories of, an, of um, a creature like a mammoth, because it's really possible that um, travelers, um, traders and, and peoples um, would have encountered them on that island. It wouldn't have been, you know, it, it's totally possible. So Wow. And just the fact that they probably found bones and, and it was in their recent memory as it got passed down through generations. So that's my next project when I have time to have a next project. All right, I'll keep going, but here comes it. So it's really amazing to think too um, about this iconic hump on the woolly mammoth right here. So I'm just gonna put my cursor on here. They had this hump. What's this hump about? This hump is actually kind of just like a camel's hump. Um, and instead of storing water, it did store water because let's just go back for a minute. It would have been hard to find fresh open water to drink regularly. Um, and for a body to take frozen snow or ice and turn it into drinkable a drinkable solution takes a lot of energy. So this elephant was able to store water in that hump, but it didn't only store water there. It was actually, um, and this gives it away right here, it stored brown fat. And brown fat is really important for this animal. It stored brown fat and brown fat can be metabolized really fast into the body. So when food was scarce and it would have been, it might've been hard, the weather was erratic, um, the glaciers were moving. There, it was not an easy time for living. Um, there might have been times where there were no food or very little food or scarce food. So to be able to have a little bit of a picnic basket stored in your own body is a really great way to survive extreme temperatures, whether it's a really cold environment like um, an ice age environment or a desert environment like a camel would. But I think that's really cool too. And it makes me feel good about um, a little bit of, uh, not, I don't have brown fat, but I'm okay with a little bit of paunch that I might have because maybe I might need it later in the future. I don't know. Um, so what happened? What happened to the animals? There was a mass extinction. Um, so, you know, the majority of woolly mammoths were gone by the end of the ice age. There was that holdout on Wrangell Island but really the majority of them were really gone. And this was a great extinction because it wasn't just the woolly mammoth that disappeared. All of these animals, um, the saber-toothed tiger, kind of the megafauna of the, um, of the ice age were gone. The woolly rhinoceros, the saber-toothed tiger, the dire wolf no longer existed. And this is this topic is really kind of controversial. You can spend a lot of time reading lots of different theories on the internet and you can get sidetracked. And I'm, I'm not going to come down one way or the other. I'm just going to put out some theories that are out there. Um, and one theory is, could it have been, um, could it have been bad grass? Um, this theory seems really interesting because what it's talking about is as the Ice Age ended, so as the Pleistocene era ended and the Holocene era began, which is what we're in right now, and the ice receded and the grasses returned and forests started to grow, was it enough of a change that the food that a woolly mammoth would have eaten and they were specialists on the grasses and flowers and shrubs and sedges. That's what they ate. That's what their teeth were designed for. Um, 
Was there less and less of it? So were they being squeezed that way? Was their food source disappearing? Was the grasses that they ate no longer there for them to find? And that this is actually quite a big theory um, right now that they were um, pretty specialized in the type of grasses that they ate and they needed those. They had specific um, enzymes and energy and minerals and vitamins and all that kind of good stuff that they needed to fuel their body. And as the weather changed and the soil changed and different plants started to grow, the plants that they would have eaten were no longer to be found and it began to squeeze them out and they, and they began to suffer kind of starvation. So that's one theory. Another theory is, was it, um, there's some theory that maybe there was another meteorite just like that did in the dinosaurs. Was there something like that that happened to some sort of catastrophic earth event that changed, um, that destroyed them? Um, or was it humans? This is a big controversial topic. There's some people that feel like, well, humans hunted them and they hunted them to extinction. But I gotta just say, um, the research that I read shows that one woolly mammoth butchered for food could feed 400 people for six weeks. Now that's a lot of people. And so I wondered like, well, how did they store food? Like how did they store a woolly mammoth's body after they butchered it? Um, they didn't have refrigeration. But there's a lot of evidence that shows that these paleo people used a natural refrigeration called ponding, where they would, well, we call it ponding, where they would take um, meats and they would store them in water, um, under, under the water. They kind of weigh them down and that it was naturally cold there. And I think that that's re really possible. And they're finding some archaeological evidence to show that they would tie them in these things and weigh them down with rocks. And, um, but could, could, were there enough people in um, North America to completely wipe out herds of woolly mammoths? And these were, there were lots of woolly mammoths. I mean, thousands and thousands of woolly mammoths and not thousands and thousands of people in, in um, the Americas yet. So this idea that it was completely humans is um, questionable. But I guess I've come to think that maybe it was a combination between um, humans and climate change, that the change of the climate, the, the receding glaciers, the change in the soil, the different plants that were growing, the rise in temperature, that it did stress these um, large, large animals out and these animals that had been uh, evolved to really live in freezing temperatures and eat specific types of grasses and flowers, couldn't find enough. And then there were more people um, and they were eating them. And there's lots of human evidence um, that mammoths were a part of paleo people's lives. There's um, shelters that have been found. And just recently in 2014 in Russia, they found a shelter. This is a reconstruction of it, uh, mammoth bones over 60 mammoth um, bones found in a, one area that were covered in hide. Not all mammoth hide, but hides of different animals. But what was weird about it is it was a really big shelter and had very little human evidence inside the shelter. It wasn't like they were living in there. And a, a theory that people think is that maybe it was the larder, kind of where they stored their food. So they did, they did use mammoth bones, for building, um, for tool making. They used mammoth fur for clothing. Um, the first musical instrument ever discovered so far is actually made out of mammoth bone. It was a flute. So they were using mammoth things, mammoth bones for, for making things like this. And they definitely revered the mammoth. They were in, or not revered, they paid attention. We don't know if this is revered. I'd like to assume that if you're gonna spend time making a little amulet of an animal, that it was an important animal to you. Um, so they painted them um, in the caves. There's lots of mammoth pictures and they carved them out of mammoth ivory and stone and bones. Um, so there, there was a relationship there, but could humans have completely contributed to the, um, the total extinction of this animal? 
I'm not so sure. What is interesting to me is it wasn't just the mammoth that went extinct. It was all the megafauna. So I'm thinking that it was something uh, more like if the mammoth went extinct, maybe there were, because of climate change, maybe there were other animals that had similar situations. Um, and then humans added an extra bit of pressure to them. Before I get into cloning woolly mammoths, which is the last part of my talk today, um, I wanna make sure and see if there's any questions about the extinction of the woolly mammoth and the other megafauna and mammoths and humans, because that's always a really fascinating and provocative topic for people. Um, so if anyone has any questions, please put them in the chat or the q and I, I do have a, a question about the extinction um, here. So do we have any idea when they would have disappeared from the New England landscape? No, oh, it's a little vague. Um, you know, they say between 10 and 11,000 years ago. Um, and there were humans here at that same time. I know that in the town where I live or live near in Keene, New Hampshire, they found um, a paleo site that dated back to, I think about 11,000 years ago. So there was. When I've talked with Bob Goodby, he's a professor at Franklin Pierce that did the excavation. And I asked him about, um, humans and mammoths and the use, he said that there's, there isn't as much evidence as you would think of them um, hunting and using mammoths regularly in New England, because, um, I mean, that's a big undertaking. This is a risky business to go after a huge animal like this, um, when you might do just as better finding food in smaller animals that are less dangerous for you to hunt. Um, for example, he said that um, in the site in Keene, they found that the people were eating snakes and turtles, a lot easier to catch than a woolly mammoth and to support a small group of people. And a, a lot easier to be able to get on the move um, with your stuff. There's some theories that say that the hunting of mammoths, the fact that people had to work together and communicate more um, could have led to a kind of a, a development, a, a brain development, or this would be true for hunting any type of large prey predator where or prey where you have to work together and communicate your plan. So that's just an interesting theory that I'm curious about too. And then it's kind of, I think, goes along with it. Melanie is wondering that shelter that you showed before, um, do you know if the bones found in that shelter were from several different mammoths? Has anyone done any DNA testing? Yes, yes. It, they, they say they're from different mammoths. There was also, you might have seen this um, just recently in Mexico where they're building a new airport. They found a similar site. It was in a pit. And they found, you know, like over 70 different mammoths that they've I've been able to identify and more to come. It seems as though it was a pit and there might be some evidence that humans um, kind of drove these elephants into the pit or an alternative theory is the elephants ended up in the pit and the humans took advantage of it. So it's, it's hard to know. Wouldn't it have been so good to just be able to go back in time and see what's happening? And I would imagine that as our science gets better and sadly, as our permafrost melts um, and we have more um, kind of evidence appearing, we'll have a better picture of the last days of the mammoth or how they interacted with humans at the end. Uh, that would be my prediction that we'll be making some more discoveries about humans and mammoth as time goes on. Um, so that's all we've got for questions Great. at the moment. Okay, so now for this exciting and kind of interesting topic about could we have, could we have, do we have the technology to make mammoths walk the earth again? Um, can we clone them? Can we do something else with them? And I like this cartoon. <laughs> you would think that maybe me as a person who loves woolly mammoths would be really excited about this, but I have a lot of, um, I have a lot of thoughts about this and a lot of conflict around it. And I'm just gonna talk about kind of the science. So um, what they're finding now is that they have been able to extract DNA from mammoth finds. And they're finding, as I mentioned, lots of viable DNA in bones and fur. And recently um, in Russia, this is, hasn't been 
documented 100%, but they, they said they found a mammoth that had still liquid blood in it. And if they had liquid blood, that's really interesting because then that's got lots of information. They've been able to kind of map out the genome of the, of the mammoth. And this has led to the idea of creating a woolly mammoth hybrid. And what they would do is they would use the DNA extracted from the woolly mammoth and they would combine it with the Asian elephant, which is its closest kin. And then it would be kind of like a, a combination of a woolly mammoth and an Asian elephant. And um, there's a lot of interest in this, uh, particularly in Russia, in the, in the steppe tundra in the steppes. And this is why, I forget the guy's name. Oh, there's a Russian guy who's really trying hard to make sure that the steppe doesn't disappear. Because again, I come back to climate change. As our climate is warming, the grasses and the plants in the tundra now are changing again. And so he's been trying to stop this process by introducing animals that eat that tundra grass and then through kind of the process of eating it, it coming out in their scat or dung, it kind of helps repopulate the soil and keep the soil going. Um, and his idea is if we could just get mammoths on this landscape, then we can save the landscape. And this is an, a fascinating and interesting idea. This is Lubia. This is the um, one of the baby elephants of woolly mammoths found in Russia. Complete, and you can see it. It's a complete. It's a complete one that they found. It doesn't have a lot of fur, but that's just because its fur was um, decomposed, but the body remained. It kind of got like freeze dried, um, and this is one of the animals that they're getting a lot of the DNA from. So my question to you is, what what is the What's the end of the story, right? Have we tried this before Well, or thought about it? Does this have a good end to it? If we take an animal from the past and try to bring it back, can it survive in the common and current world that we live in? Should we be using this technology and thinking about animals that have been extinct and think more about animals that are on the brink of extinction instead and be working towards that? Should we be putting our best minds in that place instead of trying to return an animal whose um, landscape has changed, changed drastically and put them in into a warming world? I think the idea of having woolly mammoths back on our planet is an exciting and imaginative and interesting idea, but is it really based in the best use of our technology or in the best interest of the mammoth itself? And on that note, I'm just gonna end with the idea that um, we, can, we have a lesson to learn from the woolly mammoth, um, not only how much we could love it and how cool it was that it lived here and how tomorrow when you go outside and, and you put your hand on one of uh, New Hampshire's amazing granite rocks, you might be touching a rock where a woolly mammoth rubbed its back. I mean, just in that point alone, it's amazing to think of the woolly mammoth. But let's think about the lesson it has to teach us about climate change. Um, something as simple as melting a long time of a changing um, landscape from the change of the last ice age to now um, can impact something maybe so small as the way the grass grows that could have long-term implications on animals that are on this planet now, including ourselves. And so I think for us, that's a lesson that we can be thinking about when we think of the woolly mammoth. So um, I don't know if other people have other questions, but that was my, uh, what I have to share with you about woolly mammoths, my love for them, their amazing adaptations, the story of where they came from, how humans um, might have interacted with them, the theories around um, their extinction and the ideas around um, return of the woolly mammoth. So Mirka. Any questions, anything, anybody out there? I hope you liked it. Uh, well, I find this fascinating. So if anyone has questions, please put them in the chat or the, the q and I, I did have a question. I was thinking about that last picture, which kind of shows, you know, ice and snow, but then also bare ground and, and things like that. Um, do we have any idea it, that they might have been uh, seasonally moving around? Is there yeah. any? Yeah, I mean, they definitely were following the tundra grass. 
And so, you know, the seasons of the ice age weren't so clear. It was just like the ice age, but there were, but there were warming areas and warming trends and, and spots where they would go. And they definitely would be moving just like a herd of any herbivore following the grasses. So they would go where the grasses and the, and the plants were available, but sometimes, you know, um, life and weather was unpredictable in the ice age, just as it is now. And so sometimes they might be moving to a spot that seems like a good choice. And then, you know, it's a dead end or there's a, a frozen river and another yeah. glacier. So, yeah. you know, it, it was, it was, it was not an easy living. <laughs> no, no, I think that. And so in, in an earlier picture, which had shown the, the mammoths, but also the woolly rhinoceros, and there was the bird, the I'm not sure eagle or vulture flying and, and things like that. It occurred to me that out of all of those pictures, the musk ox is still there, right? So, yes. so we could, if we want to see some ice age megafauna, our best option is kind of go yes. to Alaska or Northern Canada and find that the musk ox, right? Yes. Yes. There's still some animals that existed during the ice age sort of that we still have now. And the musk ox is a really great example. And, um, you know, I can't remember the guy's name, but if you Google the Russian guy who wants to, if you Google the Russian steppe and woolly mammoth, his name comes up, he's got a big project. And I mean, his, his project is really fascinating because he has musk, he's put musk ox out there. He's put different, er, um, different types of horse. There's an, um, an ancient horse species that they put out there. And then he's actually driven tanks out there to mimic the, um, the kind of power of the mammoth mm -hmm. stepping on the land, because really that would have left seed spots and it would have scraped up the ground enough. Think of the tusks kind of pushing away and, and kind of a, a large, a huge animal moving through it. I mean, it would have dusted up the, the fragile tundra. And so that gives seeds a place to grow. And so that's what he's really trying to be thinking about. And that's why he's motivated to have the, the woolly mammoth return. Um, and, well, and it, I mean, it makes sense, certainly, if we if we think about places where uh, bison have been reintroduced in an attempt to to mimic, you know, having those herds moving around or, or any time I think I've ever seen uh, a documentary talking about African elephants, they always mention how the elephants knock down the trees and make sp space for the grasses. So I, I feel like, you know, just from what we see around us, it would make it would make sense um, yeah. that way. Yeah, I mean, it, it's really an interesting thought. And um, some of the things that I've read too, is it, is it really fair to put a woolly mammoth back in a place that, that already killed it once? So um, if the food that it would have eaten is no longer there because it's long as, as extinct or longer extinct than the mammoth itself, then to put a mammoth back out, would it be able to find the right nutrition mm -hmm. to really have it survive? So that's an ethical question. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. And so we have some questions now coming up, which, which right. some of it, I'm going to maybe not go in the exact order, but I feel like it, it works. So one question that Samantha had was, are there any species that could act as surrogate species in the Russian steppe that, that would be similar? Yeah, um, I, you know, the guy's trying, he's got the musk oxen, and I think it's the Yerba horse and couple of types of deer out there, but no, I mean, there really isn't as huge an animal as a, a woolly mammoth to put out there. His best answer was a tank. Maybe it's, um, maybe it's like an, uh, a robot, you know, <laughs> a woolly mammoth robot. I don't know, but it's a really good question. I, I, oh, I just wish I could remember the guy's name. Here's a little bit of homework. I mean, check it out. It'll blow your mind away. It's really fascinating. National Geographic's done a really good job kind of following this guy's story. Okay. Um, and then kind of going along with, with that landscape and what it was like, uh, Jenna said, so the last picture showed mammoths and lions in the same landscape. Were there mammoths and lions living in the same place at the same time? Yeah. I mean, there were, uh, mammoths were, um, mammoths were like the the big prey item. So they lived where they lived, there were predators that were hunting them. Um, and whether they were, you know, lions or saber toothed tigers or dire wolves or things like that, um, you know, yeah, they were being hunted just, just like any juicy morsel to a predator would be hunted. And yeah. so kind of continuing with that, Jim was saying, uh, did they have natural predators other than man 
Um, and I would imagine it, it's very similar to elephants today that it kind of depends on your age and your size. A hundred percent and your health, you know, so mm -hmm. they probably wouldn't take down the male mammoth, the giant, you know, alpha or female, the big females, um, but they would definitely go after the young and the sick and the old. Mm -hmm. Just that, yeah, think of, think of what you see in the African documentaries that David Attenborough does or any of those shows. And it's really probably quite similar, just different type of landscape. You know, I mean, when we think of Africa, it's hot, it's, you know, sandy, it's limited water. Um, it's just as extreme as an extreme landscape of ice and limited water and really arid conditions, um, just cold and then cold. Right. <laughs> um, and then we've got two people asking kind of a similar uh, question, which is uh, Jim and, and Melanie both saying, do we have any idea about their family units? Was it herds of mixed sex? Were they, was it, do we know if it was like all females and young and then the males being uh, solitary a bit more the way we would see now? Do we know that? Wow. Well, they, it might be known, but I don't know that. But now I'm going to be interested in that. So thank you. Um, I love this. This has been so good for me because you guys have asked so many good questions that I feel my curiosity um, inspired by this. So um, yeah, I don't know the answer to that one. Thank you. Though, okay. for it. Um, and then David was saying, was there sexual dimorphism? Do, did both male and female mammoths have tusks? Were they roughly the same size or different sizes? Well, they're, they're, the males were bigger, um, you know, as in usual, um, kind of if you think of elephants now, the males are bigger and the females had tusks too. So, um, you know, those tusks were used for, um, just like female elephants have tusks, um, they're used for probably show of dominance or hierarchy, or um, in this case, again, for pushing away the snow for eating. And again, that, that's a theory, so it's not, you know, it's hard to know because we didn't coexist with them. So we have to do our best kind of thinking and extrapolation based on the evidence around us. Right, right. Yeah. Looking at current, yeah. current elephants and trying to, to piece things together from there. Um, and then Tersha says that Sergei Simzov and the Russian Step Project. So that's it. Thank you. Homework. <laughs> You get an A plus. Yeah, that's the guy. And I think he's involved. I think his son is involved with it too. And I mean, it's really kind of, kind of, wow, mind blowing. And I mean, I'll tell you there, the technology is there. Um, and it, it, who knows, maybe in some Russian, um, you know, we don't know what's happening in Russia or China. China's really invested in this too. They have similar Mongolia, kind of a similar landscape. Um, we don't really know what's happening. It's not a transparent thing. And even here, there's companies that are interested in it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it would be it would be um, really amazing. And in some ways, it could have implications on animals that are on the brink of extinction now. So if you can figure out how to do it with something like a mammoth, then right, especially like a, if you don't have perfect DNA. Right. You know. Right. But you right. can get a good sample from a, an endangered species, then, you know, yeah. you have even a better chance. Yeah. And I mean, there's there's um, organizations that are doing, they're collecting the DNA samples of animals on the brink of extinction to have it so that when the technology is there, they can figure it out. But I mean, we've got a lot of things to figure out. <laughs> <laughs> so um, again, I, my thinking is, wouldn't it be good if we could put our energy to thinking about the animals that are in peril now instead of thinking about the animals that are already gone. Yeah, a, a bit more uh, proactive than exactly. reactive. Okay, and so Jim has a few more questions. Um, were they considered to be intelligent? I mean, not that we would necessarily have witnessed this, but you know, like today's elephants. Well, I mean, that's such a great question. Elephants today, they have such um, a um, kind of a deep intelligence, their social hierarchy and, and, and um, they mourn, um, you know, they they take, they work as a community to take care of the young, they take care of the sick. I don't know. I, I don't know if, if woolly mammoths had that. They were an, a herd animal. And in a way, a herd animal is a social, one giant social organism in some ways, because the, the herd is better together than they are separately. So there had to have been sort of communication and a way of 
uh, managing each other and communicating with each other and kind of looking after one another, being aware of one another to have survived. And they they did live in herds. They do know that. Okay. Um, and then he also was wondering, do we know what their average lifespan was? Good question. No, I don't know that for sure. Um, it was hard living out there and they, are, they do find a lot of babies in the permafrost. Um, that's a common find. So um, maybe if you make it past your first year, um, that's good. You know, a baby doesn't have enough time to accumulate, you know, the brown fat that it might need or, you know, or keep up with an, a herd that has to move away from a predator, all those things. So I think it's really similar to any kind of animal that we have here. The first part of your life is the hardest. And then the second hardest part is the end of your life when you're, when you might be old or infirmed. Boo-hoo on that. <laughs> um, so then is, is asking, do you know, can you age a mammoth by the tusks? Do they do, is it rings? Is it similar to that or layers or anything like that? Oh, she's, you're muted. So I can't hear what you're saying or. I know my, my dire wolves are barking in the background. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I think I just was recently reading that they're coming up. They can do some aging based on the tusks. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, Jim asking about the, the lifespan, um, you know, you could probably look and see what they're finding out about the average lifespan. But I'm imagining that it's probably similar to elephants nowadays. They probably were long lived. Sorry about that. So Dean says that some of these studies have placed the average lifespan of a, a woolly mammoth to approximately 60 years. Um, I was just thinking it would be a little difficult sometimes to use the remains because if if we know, for example, that the first year of an animal's life is, is one of the most challenging, so we're losing a lot of babies. But then if, if there is active hunting, then um, that's not going to show you a, like a, a representative sample of the population either. It's 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 going to be, I mean, they're not going to go for the animals necessarily in their prime. So once again, you know, is that going to show you kind of what the average is? So yeah, it, it probably is really challenging to, to get a good idea of that one. Yeah, I mean, I think part of why um, woolly mammoths fascinate me too is, is there are still, uh, there's a lot of mystery around them, you know, um, and I, I'm probably like everybody else, um, as a human, I wonder what the relationship was between human and mammoth. Like I was lucky enough to go into one of the caves in France um, and see some of those drawings and the fact that they drew the mammoths, um, you know, they represented it. Um, and that the, one of the first musical instruments found was made out of mammoth bone or, or that they carved it. Um, you know, I, I don't, I think my curiosity, maybe my obsession is a little overboard, but I think as humans to be curious about a, a mammoth is almost like hardwired in us. Like we were really, we were paying attention to them when we share the same landscape. And there's a piece of us that still really wants to pay attention to them. Um, so I love that people are asking me questions that I don't know the answer to. <laughs> uh, I probably did know the answer to when I was 10 because I read everything I could about woolly right. mammoth. But now that I'm 50, the information I've... may have changed. So, yeah, that's true. As well. So let's that's do true. let's do one final question. Um, and Mary is wondering, do we know at what age they became adults or became mature? Um, I mean, I would assume it's similar to an elephant that there is there is kind of an immature period. Yeah, I'm sure that it was similar um, because it was a long lived animal um, because it was a, uh, a, a herd animal like that and it was so big, chances are that it had a juvenile period that was quite long before it became sexually mature. Um, unlike something like a vole, which, you know, is can mate like three weeks after it's born. Oh, so limited amount of time, right? Limited amount of time, right. So, you know, I would I would imagine that, um, you know, it was probably years before they were able to enter um, into breeding. Mm -hmm. But again, uh, something I'll need to be paying attention to. When I come back from my mastodon talk. Exactly, believe me, I will be taking you up on that <laughs> offer. <laughs> when I come, when I do my mastodon talk, I'll have all my mastodon, I'll get, I'll get caught up on all of those. Well, we're going to have tougher questions then because we oh have to prepare now. So yeah, that's right. Um, Sounds good. I want to, I want to thank Susie again. This was fantastic. Um, uh, not just her enthusiasm, but I learned so much. And once again, I really wish I could have seen these, 
these creatures um, as they were roaming the landscape. And I want to thank all of you for joining us as well on a Friday night um, and giving us some great questions and things to think about. If you are like me and you're the kind of person who thinks of something later on and wishes they had asked it, you can definitely send me any any of those and I will pass those along to Susie. For all of you who, who are here today, tomorrow you're going to get a follow-up email saying thank you. Also asking if you had any suggestions, comments. <laughs> um, clearly the dogs did. And, uh, and my email will be in that message tomorrow so that you can send stuff to me and then I will send it to Susie. Or you can go to the Harris Center website and you can find her there as well, Susie Spickle. Um, and I'm, I know that she loves sharing information, so I'm sure that she would be happy to, to answer any of the questions. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you, Mirka, for um, having me do this. This was such a highlight of my week. I'm sorry my dogs are barking. And thank you all for listening to my crazy obsession about woolly mammoths, which has been long in coming. <laughs> and the awesome questions. I just love it. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Hope you have a wonderful weekend. Um, for those of you who are who are feeling like you need a little bit of space in your lives. I just want to remind you that today and tomorrow, this is the 50th anniversary of Apollo 14 landing on the moon. Um, Alan Shepard landed 50 years ago today. So we did a ton of check-ins on social media and videos from across the state for that. Tomorrow he plays golf on the moon 50 years ago. Um, so there'll be other stuff to, to pay attention to there. So you can check Starhop for um, a special Apollo 14 page with information. And you can also check our Facebook and our Twitter and things like that for links to all of the stuff that we've been doing. But have a great weekend. Um, and um, think about mammoths, because that's definitely what I'm going to be thinking about for a while. <laughs> I know, right? Oh my gosh, this is fantastic. OK, thanks, everyone. Good night. See you later. <laughs>